Welcome to a special holiday Thanksgiving edition of Weather and Climate Chat, airing a little early this week so you can uh, get ready for your Thanksgiving and know what uh, to plan for. And uh, this is Monsoon Mike with Dr. Michael Davis. Welcome back, sir. Thanks for having me, and happy Thanksgiving to all our listeners. Happy Thanksgiving to all of our listeners, and uh, interesting weather. I say that every week. Um, Now, right around now, especially yesterday, um, first real feel for, dare I say, almost winter-like feel in the air? Yeah, we had a lot cooler temperatures. Yeah. Certainly did that with um, about 30 degrees or so in some areas. I think even up toward the Poconos, they may have gotten in the 20s. Yep. I saw a couple flurries flying around Kutztown Mm -hmm. yesterday. uh, Yesterday. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't myself, but I I did see about the 16 inches of snow that southern Wisconsin got in some areas of the central plains. So already some interesting weather happening. I know Iowa last week got a good dose of snow. And uh, funny thing about that, though, is if uh, they're actually going to be in the heart of some of that really warm weather that's going to affect us a little bit. Uh, later this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as cold as it is now is as total opposite as it'll be later this week. In fact, the old adage or the old uh, uh, legend about standing out for those Black Friday sales at three in the morning on, on Black Friday and, and freezing your behind off, you're not really going to freeze that bad this Friday. In fact, Friday could be near record highs I saw. Yeah, we might be pushing 60, maybe even the mid 60s. Yeah, I'm going to be aggressive as I have the past couple times, just seeing how I, this has continually happened like every time. I'm going to say I wouldn't be surprised if we see a renegade 65 somewhere. Am I, is that I wouldn't say 65, but I'm going to say like 63, 64. All right. So a little bit below that. <laughs> okay. I would go conservative, but okay. that's burned me in the past. All right. All right. So so now that you're actually on this more aggressive side, watch it only stick in the 50s now <laughs> <laughs> and burn us both. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, so the long and short of it is, is Thursday and Friday look pretty pretty nice, pretty mild. Yeah, we have a ridge that's going to be building across the eastern yeah. U.S. associated with the high pressure that's going to be sitting off the Nova Scotia coast, which is going to be giving us very nice weather. Right. By the way, I did look up the record high for Friday, and I think in uh, Allentown or Reading or maybe both, uh, it, the, the record was 65. So if we do get get to 65, it would be a tie tie of a record. So we'll should be coming be a, close. Should be a nice day for the Thanksgiving Day Parade in yep. New York City for those who watch on TV. Now, that won't be permanent. That'll be kind of like a one- or two-day wonder because it looks like uh, right away on Saturday, hot on its heels, we have another cold front coming in, and then we get back to normal conditions again. Yeah, and a lot of rain, maybe some snow in some areas. But let's enjoy the nice holiday weather while it's here. Now, when you say maybe snow, are you talking about here or other other Uh, Not here, but associated with the system. Uh, It depends on where exactly you're going, but our area should be mostly rain. Okay, so uh, summarizing for Thanksgiving for travelers, Wednesday, uh, dr- driving day for a lot of people, looks basically a nice day. Still a little chilly, but nice. Yeah, about the eastern half of the country should be pretty um, pleasant weather to right. be driving around. Uh, Temperature-wise, should be around 50 or so. So nice driving weather. If you're trying to fly across country, like the West Coast, you'd probably be encountering some disturbed weather across the central plains and the rockies but other than that if you're staying relatively close to home you should have nice weather not too shabby and then thursday turkey day thanksgiving day also pretty nice with temperatures spiking another you know if wednesday's about 50 then we'll spike at about another eight or so degrees on thursday up upper 50s it looks like yeah, upper 50s sunny for okay. thanksgiving very nice and then friday for you black friday shoppers you won't freeze your behind off this black friday it looks pretty pretty nice Yes, it does. In fact, we could be, like we talked about, record highs. Right. Now, we could see some increase in clouds a little later on Friday, it looks like. Yeah, that's going to be in association with the frontal passage that's okay. approaching. I know the models have been waffling a little bit on the exact frontal timing. I think the GFS is more aggressive with the timing as it usually is. But what's it looking like, Saturday midday or so, I believe, I saw last? Yeah, sometimes Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it varying anywhere from like Saturday morning to Saturday afternoon. Right. So sometime early in the day, Saturday. So temperatures Saturday could be a little, you know, questionable. I mean, it'll, the front still will have yet to pass in the morning, but probably be clouds at that point. So temperatures shouldn't get too crazy on Saturday. And what's that, uh, the small market, uh, small business Saturday or whatever? Yeah, they have a new name for everything. It's Black Friday, small business Saturday, and I know Monday. Cyber Monday. Cyber Monday, and also first day of buck for our hunting friends out there. That's right. Yeah, so people that are in hunting there, I, I keep hearing that term, first day of buck. I'm not a hunter, but I've... I, had to add that to the Monsoon mm-hmm. Mike page because everybody else is. It's like, okay, I guess that's a big day. So, um, okay, so then Sunday and on we get back in. It looks like more of a seasonally chilly 
permanent, semi-permanent pattern. Yeah, we'll be back to uh, the grips of fall by next week. If not, maybe getting a few tastes of winter along the way. I don't see any really, and of course that could change, but I don't really see any crazy spikes back to unseasonable warmth, at least for the foreseeable future, after this spike of warmth. No, I don't think so. I I, I don't think we've hit 70 yet. Earlier this month, I said, I think we're done with the 70s. Yeah, you were right. So far, we're looking okay there. I got aggressive (laughs) with it, and I said I would see it again, and I came close. What was that, that last Monday? We had 68. Yeah, we came close. Yeah, it was was dangerously close, but so far, I think you're right. I think you're probably safe for the rest of the year at this point, Uh, but you never know. Um, And, of course, I see some other pages getting excited about these fantasy models that have us getting into uh, a snowy pattern in, in December, but I'm not sold on that. I think it just December looks fairly seasonally chilly to me. It just depends on what this El Nino wants to do. Well, that's true. Yeah, we don't in know. In fact, there was a lot of rain and snow in the Sierra Nevada out west, and they certainly need the water out there. That is true. So, uh, well, <laughs> never mind. I was, <laughs> was going to say, what's our chances for a white Christmas? But let's just get past one holiday at a time. <laughs> yeah, one step at a time here. <laughs> yeah, because I know people, as soon as Thanksgiving passes already, the meteorologists are getting uh, bombarded with, uh, what's the chances of a white Christmas? Okay, <laughs> so... In the past, I would have said maybe probably not much of a chance at all this year, but already this is shaping up to be a strange year, so I, anything's possible. Climatologically, it's usually yeah. around 25 30% chance, right. but with the El Nino, I'd probably go a little bit lower than that. Right. But Me too. We'll see. I mean, but watch us be wrong and have it's, a It's about a month away. Yeah. We have exactly. still plenty of time to see what happens. I still get a kick out of the and, and no no disrespect to AccuWeather, but because uh, they're great people, but I get I get a kick out of their forty five day forecast. Have you ever looked at that? Yeah, that, Before, that's baloney. You can't. I know. Okay. So, so, if it was, so if it was up to that, if it was up to me, I wouldn't even post that because then you have people. Believe it or not, I already had somebody come to my page and send me a private message. Monsoon Mike. It says uh, an ice storm on Christmas Day, and sure enough, I, I typed in the zip code and it had an ice storm for us on Christmas Day. And I'm like, how far away is Christmas? Thirty two days. <laughs> I could say it's ninety degrees on Christmas Day. And you could. It could be. Correct, it could be too. just as correct. So, yeah. So if I were AccuWeather. I probably wouldn't post that because too many people will take that for word. Mm -hmm. And then when it's wrong, they'll be like, oh, it's, they lied. It's 60 and it's, why did they scare me with an ice storm? Well, maybe you shouldn't have put that, put that up there. Well, whatever. That's no disrespect to them if they want to have their 45 day forecast. What is that 45 day forecast? Basically straight off the GFS model, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much the guidance you have to go with. So might as well just go with whatever is telling you the 45 days or even further out. There's longer range outlook uh, models that do exist. Watch us have a nice storm on Christmas Day, and then the GFS will have the laugh at us. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, but okay, so there you go, folks. There's your hol- there's your holiday forecast. It looks pretty nice straight through the weekend, uh, starting extremely warm and well, not extremely. That's probably a over over uh, over the top adjective, but unseasonably warm. We'll say. Yeah, let's go with that word. And then uh, getting extremely would be into the 70s or or something like that, and then t- getting back to more normal temperatures for. Cyber Monday and the first day of Buck. Yeah, the average temperature, above average temperatures for yeah. the next couple of days, and just in time for holiday so you can spend it with your family and friends and enjoy the weather. Can't beat it. All right, so there you have it, folks. Okay, so what's our topic of the week, Dr. Davis? Um, I was thinking we could talk a little bit about the whole uh, climate talks that are going to be going on in Paris. Yes. We have the... Uh, Climate talks that are scheduled to go on between an uh, international consortium of uh, members of different countries coming together to talk about differences uh, that can, they can bridge in order to come up with some type of climate accord to deal with greenhouse gases. Okay. And unfortunately, it happens in the shadow of the Green terrorist space. attack yep. that happened in Paris. So there was talk that maybe they would cancel the whole conference, but that since uh, passed, they did cut back a little bit on the outdoor activities like uh, March and uh, some outdoor festivities to go along with it because of security reasons, but the conference itself will go on Good. even though you are going to have a massive amount of security there. I'm sure. Yeah, And it's interesting to note that the countries are now starting to come to the table with their own I guess, ideas that can be used toward crafting this document for different countries. So, for example, Obama has stated that he wants to cut carbon emissions by 30% by 2030. So that's pretty much what the U.S. is going to come to the table uh, willing to offer. 
But then other countries like Japan, the UK, Germany, other developed worlds will come with their own plans. And then you have the developing world, they'll come with their own plans as well and see what exactly can be crafted. Now, five years ago, or maybe it was six, five, six years ago, when we had the uh, meeting that was going on in Copenhagen, Denmark, the agreements that were trying to be pushed forward were pretty much thrown out of whack from the uh, developing worlds that said that it's not doing as much for us, so we are essentially leaving the discussions. So negotiations are kind of strange uh, situation that you might have there where you have to cater to both the developed world's sense of industrialized nations already exerting a lot of carbon versus the developing world, which is still trying to get their economy to the stage of the developed worlds, but will have restrictions placed on them when the previously the developed countries did not have that. Hmm. Very good. So now, the, be, being that this all comes in under the shadows, uh, unfortunately, of the, the horrible Paris attacks, do you think that that will weigh into any... I mean, you know, our uh, Bernie Sanders, who, you know, I, I'll proudly say that I, I support, and I think you do too, came out with a pretty, um, in some ways, controversial, powerful remark about a week or so ago saying that he links... Um, terrorism one of the main reasons to climate change so do you think that what happened in paris will have any impact on what goes on at at these uh, these talks i can't speak for what's going to happen with the delegates but i would certainly think that they need to consider climate change potentially impacting uh, things like terrorism and things like water crises So when they had the second democratic debate and they asked what's the greatest risk to national security, this was, I believe, the day after the Paris attacks, when Bernie Sanders said, I still believe climate change is the number one national security threat because it factors into what we're seeing in the Middle East. And we were speaking off air that a lot of people said that's weird, that's They're two unrelated topics. Right. But in all actuality, they are related. Yeah. Because you have climate change, which is occurring in the desert areas, the arid areas, such as the Middle East. Yep. And that's putting extra stress on the water availability there. The arable land that's used to grow crops. And if you don't have that, people are going to say, I can't live here anymore. I can't grow food, I can't drink water, I can't live here. So then they become pretty much migrants or refugees looking to go elsewhere, and then that's when they see Europe as a potential destination. I'm not saying that climate change is the number one and sole driver of what we're seeing, but it certainly is factoring into it. You have then the people in the Middle East that say, have the power that think, hey, I need to control land, I need to control the water, which are in scarce supply, they can exert that, force that power upon those that don't have it, and then you start to breed things such as terrorism. Yep. And in fact, there was a article just published earlier this year by uh, Colin Kelly, I forget his affiliation, but it was one that was uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that was talking about this very same issue where they were talking about drought and climate change in the Fertile Crescent and Syria. And he basically said it has an indirect effect on terrorism Mm. and the rise of ISIS. So you have this argument being brought forth that you have climate change factoring into this whole um, myriad of national security, uh, terrorism, and issues that are actually centered on climate change. Just uh, last week, we had Prince Charles of the UK come out and say, what we're seeing in Syria is related to climate change. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we're seeing is all dependent on climate change, which is occurring at different rates, different speeds, different impacts across this globe. And if we don't have a planet to actually sustain ourselves, yeah. what do we have? That's what I was just going to say. I mean, a lot of people who will think that that's, that's a crazy or, or a weird thing to say, linking those two things, well, if we don't have a place to 
exist, then all that other stuff doesn't exist. So Mm -hmm. it all comes back to that. And (laughs) this may just be the tip of the iceberg because there's many other areas that are having water crises, uh, food crises. Well, even right here in the U.S., I mean, California, Arizona. California, Arizona, exactly. So if you're talking, just a few years ago, the state climatologist in Arizona said that the city of Phoenix in the summertime may not dip below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. So the daytime highs could be something like 120, 130, even right. higher. And then the nighttime lows, when you should be cooling down... Will be about 100. Or about 100. And you're expecting Phoenix, which is, I believe, the top five largest populated cities in if this not country. five, at least in the top it's 10, yeah. At least top 10, yeah. depending on whose numbers you actually right, use. Right, right. But if they have a very large city... Something's going to have to give there. Something's going to give, yeah. Whether it be just people leaving or not many people want to come live in the middle of a desert. Right, right. Especially if you're not cooling down at night. Wow. So that water crisis going on there, water crises in California. We're starting to get some water crises developing in the southeastern U.S. in terms of uh, aquifers being used and even get saltwater intrusion. So now all of a sudden, because of the rate you're using the water, that essentially dips lower and the salt water can infiltrate those aquifers and give it your drinking water salt now. Wow. And then you can't drink them anymore. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's going to be very interesting to follow. Now, when are these talks uh, exactly again? Next week or? They start November 30th. So okay. So next, next week. week. Okay. And I believe they're scheduled to go on for a week or two. I think so. Okay. Early into December, mid-December. Hopefully we get something out of it. Uh, the last climate talks pretty much try to make a one size fits none. One, yeah, exactly. Sort of agreement that everyone just simply couldn't agree to. Just pretty much dismissed it, yeah. But now the individual countries that I mentioned are coming with their own, with their ideas, own ideas. So maybe we can try to find some common ground with them. And there was an interesting talk I was hearing on the radio this morning talking about the psychological effects of that and how the developing world wants simply fairness rather than a rational. Uh, agreement. Hmm. So if you are trying to offer a rational one, like, hey, you need to cut back this much, right? they would say that, no, we want to continue expanding our economy just like how you did because that's what's fair. Right. I think they gave the, up the analogy of if you have $100 and you gave $1 to your friend, kept $99, it seems rational that you gave them something. Right. But is that actually fair? Right, right. So... That's pretty much the argument they were making on the psychological side, which I found sort of fascinating because I never really thought of it that from way. a psychological lens. Well, good stuff. Well, we're definitely going to have to follow where this goes, and maybe by the time we next chat, which will be about a, over a week, it'll be longer than usual since we have the holiday in between, we'll have heard some news headlines come out of the talks and see where they're, what direction they're heading. Definitely. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Michael Davis. Um, for joining us a little early this week for the holidays. Once again, just a recap, looks like a fairly nice holiday, starting warm, ending cool. Um, And uh, we'll we'll join you again at the end of, uh, well, let's see, that'll be December 4th will be our next time Mm -hmm. together. All right. Before finals. Have a good holiday. You too.